we know of no other species yet that is able to leave behind not merely some of its physical self, its skull, its ribs, maybe a little bit of fur and eventually a fossil. We are able to leave behind some of our thoughts. Hello, welcome to the next episode of Bibliomaniac, the tour and the documentary series. Uh, now, in the book Bibliomaniac, I only went around UK bookshops, but on this occasion, we're actually going to Prague because when someone gets in contact with you and says, would you like to come and talk at a book conference in Prague? You immediately say yes, yeah, because uh, you're getting the chance to go and work in Prague. And uh, it also means because there were a lot of bookshop owners there that I'd met before, uh, it was lovely to go to a conference and see bookshop owners when they're relaxing a bit on the Saturday night and having a few drinks and spreading all manner of scurrilous gossip as well. Of course, the scurrilous gossip has been entirely removed uh, from the documentary, but you'll see its undercurrents. And, uh, and also it means that now, every time I go to an independent bookshop, more often than not, I can say, ah, Charlotte, we haven't seen each other since Prague, which means that it feels very much like I'm in a John le Carré novel on certain days of my life. But this is also because we ended up talking quite a lot um, uh, about how you market LGBTQI books and, uh, and also generally getting independent publishers and some of the more uh, kind of progressive literature, which independent bookshops are often very, very good at actually being the place where you can find it, uh, find those kind of books. Um, it means that we talked, well, th there's some other things in this as well, as well as the fantastic Rise Book Conference in Prague. Uh, there's also a little bit of uh, Burko Fest where I spoke to Lewis Hancock, whose book Welcome St. Hell is fantastic. You'll find out more about Welcome St. Hell later on in, uh, in this film. And uh, also a little bit of me at Warwick Bookshop, which is another just uh, Mog and Pauline who run that bookshop are wonderful people. And in fact, they're the people who recommended one of my favorite books of 2023, which was uh, A Short History of Queer Women. If you have not read this book, you must read this book because uh, it is a book, Kirsty who wrote it, it feels like you're sat in a pub with someone who's had a couple of drinks and they're filled with an incredible amount of knowledge and they really want to impart it to you. So we talk about some of these things. Welcome to Prague. Here is Bibliomaniac. <laughs> Ince is a comedian, broadcaster, and author, and a popularizer of scientific ideas. During the pandemic, Robin visited over 100 bookshops, and how could we not love an author who does that? And then writes a book called Bibliomaniac, an obsessive tour of the bookshops of Britain, and then visits the bookshops all over again to promote the book and be encouraged and inspired booksellers again, as well as many others. The man is a legend, Robin Ince. I'm going to try as much as possible to be reactive to what I've seen today and talk about some of the wonderful panels, some of the keynote speakers. I also have a story because I know Britt, who was on the previous TikTok panel, I'm on TikTok, TikTok by the way, I'm 54 and I'm on TikTok, aren't I young? And uh, what a novelty. This, by the way, also falls if you lean on it. I've just discovered that. Um, <laughs> This is, whoever made this, I hope, is not distributing any bookshelves to you. Uh, this, in fact, there was one bookshop that I was meant to be playing when I did this tour in 2021, October, November, did 104 bookshops uh, by public transport. And if Malin, who did the keynote, thinks that German or French infrastructure is falling apart, you're in for such a treat if you come to the north of England. Um, <laughs> it is... I, I, so I'm going to try, there was a bookshop, yeah, St Helen's bookshop called Bookstop, and I went there, and they couldn't unfortunately open, I was their first ever event, uh, but unfortunately they found out there was a bookshelf shortage due to Brexit, so they couldn't open because there was nothing to put the books on. First question for you is, so this is the very first Rise book selling event, and it is, I've got to say, it is amazing. So many of the booksellers this morning at breakfast were saying for a first event to, certainly from our view, 
we can't see you paddling wildly. I mean, you might be paddling wildly under the surface, but so where did Rise Books and where did this idea come from? Uh, from several several places. Uh, we represent National Booksellers Association and some of our members have really great events like this. Our colleagues in the US have this massive conference that is just a dream. Uh, our French colleague do it, or our British colleague do it. And for me, um, because I've visited several bookshops and I realized the knowledge is there, but it's contained within the borders, I wanted to have something where people could exchange and talk to each other and realize that this one thing they're missing is maybe just out there across the border. I'm always really worried before an event when I put booksellers together from different countries that they'll be a little bit shy, that they don't talk to each other. What are they going to do? What do I do if they don't talk to each other? But then that's a natural flow for bookseller. You put them around the table, you get them to start talking returns, to start talking what they, what's their latest read. And, and I, have, I have to say I was really positively surprised at how quickly here it started and how yeah, everyone decided to, to start chatting with their neighbours. So that's, uh, that was really great. What made you love books and bookshops? Where, where, where does that start? Um, my grandma. Uh, my grandma raised me with uh, all the stories from the mythology. So instead of going to bed, my bedtime story was the stories of Ulysses and, uh, you know, the Odyssey. And, uh, and I knew all the Egyptian myth, uh, you know, story when I was a child. So I really, I grew up with books always. I've always had my nose in a book. And then I ended up actually in this job, one thing after another, a little bit randomly. But then I realized that I'm quite stuck actually and that I, I don't know what, what else I would do because I love booksellers, I love bookshops, and I couldn't see myself doing anything else actually. I have to say, um, our um, New Zealand member during COVID, uh, we were talking about are we optimistic, etc. And he said this one thing, um, you know, people will always buy two things that bring comfort, books and chocolate. So those two businesses have, you know, a uh, long still uh, time ahead of them. And he's right, actually, I think, because I, I don't personally, I'd, I've been in this job now for, for almost 10 years and, and, and I don't see, yes, people read less. Yes, it is a challenge. I'm not going to say it's easy for booksellers, but so, that's also what this conference brings, you know, positive energy. And I hope all the booksellers will go back home, yeah, with, with that energy that, that they can then put, you know, in practice in their shop. Just add the chocolate then, that's the thing that you need for the next one. It's and, brilliant. And I'm, from, I'm, I'm from a country, because everyone says Switzerland's the country of chocolate, but that's a lie. It's Belgium, so I have everything I need at home. <laughs> and so the librarians, the booksellers and the book people are my favourite people. And it was interesting because watching the panel about diversity, one of the things that I was thinking is, that's what books are. That is one of the purposes of books. We live in a world where certainly we see a lot of it in the UK and the US, and I think in a lot of other places as well, where the job of the mainstream news media is to turn everyone into a two-dimensional figure, is to dehumanize them, is to turn them into monsters, is to use them for whatever purpose is possible to make sure they're clickbait or indeed for political advantage. But I go inside a bookshop and what do I see? All of these tools that will reinflate those people, it will reinflate those groups that will turn them back into three dimensions. They are weapons of empathy. So even before we start talking about the specifics of diverse bookshops, the bookshop itself has to be a place where we are able to find so many different stories of so many different people and we are able to walk in the minds and the shoes of all of those people who may not be like us. The whole, your, your shop began in 1992, the, the, 1993, the first LGBT bookshop uh, and in, in, in Madrid, but in the whole country as well. So you said at the beginning the, there were kind of no shelves and no books. Yes, of course, when uh, I came back from New York, because I was living in New York and I live in London too, you know, uh, I decided to come back to Spain and to create Bercana, to open Bercana. And uh, I was a little bit crazy because, of course, I thought that Madrid was like New York. <laughs> I was not, it was not like that, you know. And when I opened, we didn't have books and we didn't have clients. The first month, the first year was very difficult because, of course, there were only five authors publishing some books with gay or lesbian reference, you know. 
only five Spanish ones. And we have uh, another five titles, translation only, you know. And of course, we, we thought we can't do anything with this. Means that I have to bring a lot of things from England, a lot of things from the States, you know, like uh, photo books, like comics and everything, you know. And uh, we thought about doing something and we have to create uh, Egales, that was the first publishing LGTV company to publish all the books that the people wanted to read. Because of course they had read al already all, all these books that they assisted, you know, but we needed to create the, the books that they were looking for. Books full of reference, books that they can tell their, their stories, you know, and uh, there was nothing. It means that we have to translate a lot of books from the English languages, yeah. And, and the clients, were, they were in the closet, I mean, it was very typical. They used to call us and say, but is, is the bookstore in a, in a first floor? They go, no, it's on the street, and they have a very very big windows. <laughs> and people was, was very afraid of coming into the bookstore. Well, it sounded also like in, in, in those early days, in the, in the 90s, you weren't just a bookshop. You, you were the one place where it felt that people could, could be heard and, and almost that that space was the only space, perhaps, that it, where they would go, in this shop, I can be who I am. Yeah, it was the only space during the day. The rest of the spaces, most of them, they were for gay and they were bars. Means that the, this was the big space for the people to come in and feel comfortable. I mean, they used to come just to chat. At the beginning, we did a lot of chatting with people because they, would, they wanted to chat, they wanted to tell, uh, to tell you their stories, you know. They were feeling, there were people feeling very alone, you know. And I remember that on weekends, we have a, a lot of people from outside Madrid, from the small village, uh, villages and small cities. They wanted to come to see what was that, you know, what was Bracana. And uh, this is what we did the first years of our life. And I am very happy because as Oscar Wilde and Gaze the War, they saved my life. We saved the life of many people. In fact, I received one of the first calls I received was a woman that they wanted to commit suicide because she was married with children and she knew that she was lesbian but got married, you know. And uh, it was, I, I was in shock for, for many days and I told her, call me every single day. Call me every single day. She didn't commit suicide, okay? And she's my friend now. And uh, she divorced and she has a beautiful girlfriend, okay? But this is the kind of, of, of chats that we have with people, the kind of calls that they made it, you know, to us, you know? Yeah, at the beginning we were like a, an information point for everything, like psychological support for many people, you know? And I guess it's what the people was looking for in Spain on that time, you know. On that time in Spain, it's not like now that we can get married. It's like everybody's out of the streets, like uh, you go to Madrid and see gay and lesbian people holding hands, no? On 30 years ago, it wasn't like that. And Bercana was the embryo of Chueca neighborhood because it was the first business open during the day that created visibility. And around Bercana, they start to grow what is the gay neighborhood now. That uh, it was very funny because people used to come from outside Madrid to Chueca for the weekend just to feel well, just to feel better, just to be able to, to, to be themselves in Chueca for a weekend. So one of the things that I love about all of the independent bookshops is every single one that I've been to, I have found a book that I did not see before. So even the 104th bookshop in two months, I walked into it, I saw a book, and the people who ran it went, you must read that book. And this is a lovely thing as well. Mari from Lighthouse Bookshop, she was mentioning the fact that, you know, you are allowed to curate bookshops in any way you want. They are your space. And the first thing I want to talk about is where to put the LGBT books in your bookshop. Now, Lighthouse, of course, is, is a kind of, it's an activist bookshop. It's got a very wide range of stuff. 
So you're, you're not specifically an LGBT bookshop, but of course you are, pro, well, you are the main one in, in, you are the one in Edinburgh, really, aren't yeah. you? So what do you do, that, that thing of what sections, because one guy stood up and he said that what he wants to do is make it so inclusive that you just, that all the LGBT stuff is in all the other sections. So it's in sociology and it's in fiction and it's in, but what are your ideas behind that? Uh, so it is a controversial topic. I take the approach of put them wherever they're going to sell because what we want to do is sell more LGBT books. And so we dust them over everywhere, and they should be everywhere. And you, if you have a queer writer that works in biography, stick them in biography. If it's fiction, put it in fiction. But as an LGBT reader, for me, I like finding an LGBT section. I like to be able to, the same way somebody who reads science is going to look for the science section. I think treating it like a genre where you have the shortcut of being able to be like, yeah, I don't want to sift through all the straights to find a romance that's going to have, that's going to be sapphic. To be able to go to a section where you have that says, I think to me as a buyer uh, in another bookshop, like we see you as an audience and we think that you should have this space. And I think for people who are nervous or don't know where to look, it does that as well. And so I think the idea of putting everything in sections out of a sense of like, well, LGBT people shouldn't be treated any differently and we should value them with our literature and we should put them in, I think does a similar thing to queerness as claiming color blindness around race. I think at the end of the day, those writers do get overlooked, those publishing houses do get overlooked and they get lost in the noise because we are a minority. And so giving it its own shelf gives it a better chance to actually reach an audience. So I think from a selling perspective, more people will find, buy and read LGBT books if they are given their own section. None of you here, all of the people here who run an independent bookshop, none of you have first of all got, it's, it's not been a grand moment of capitalism. I can't imagine most of you going, ah, ha, ha, I think I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to open a bookshop in Peterborough and watch the money roll in while I relax in a hammock, right? <laughs> you have become booksellers, and, well, uh, certainly of the, of the uh, you know, I've done 150, I think, in the last kind of year or so. Every single person that I meet, there is so much love there. This is uh, the Warwick Bookshop, but this was where uh, I found, uh, or in fact, it was preferred to me, uh, the brilliant book Gratitude uh, by Delphine de Vegan, which I always presume I'm saying wrong as well. And that is, again, why the curation is so important. Like, this was the first book that, when I was in the Warwick bookshop, which uh, Morgan Pauline, who ran that, uh, I, I walked into the bookshop, just looking around, and uh, I picked this one up, Gratitude by Delphine de Vegan. I don't know if any, any of you know this book. And, uh, and Mog just said, you have to read that. It's, it's wonderful. And, and Pauline, who uh, is French, she said, uh, that's a translation, but I've read it both in English and French. It's a perfect translation. This book is such a wonderful book. It is a book about a woman who is developing dementia, and as she's developing dementia, she is beginning to lose some of her words. She's developing aphasia. She used to be a translator, so words were everything. And this is the story of her younger friend, and this is the story of her going into a care home. And this is the story of also the therapist. And I just picked it up and I just read the first bit. This is uh, the voice of Marie from the book. Have you ever wondered how many times a day you say thank you? Thank you for the salt, for holding the door, for the information. Thanks for the change, for the bread, for that packet of cigarettes. Thank yous out of politeness, social convention, automatic and mechanical, almost meaningless, sometimes omitted, sometimes overemphasized. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Thanks a million. Many thanks. Professional thank yous. Thank you for your response, your attention, your participation. Have you ever wondered how many times in your life you've really said thank you? And this is the story of this woman who's losing language, her friends making sure that they find someone who she believed saved her life in the Second World War, and while she still can, saying that thank you to her. And I read that book in just one sitting. And at the end of reading that book, it had changed me. That's the whole, to me, this is part of the delight of reading and of stories, which is when you read a book like this, your understanding of the world changes, your pictures of the world change, your understanding of people's minds 
changes. All of these things are so important. It's like suddenly you are, you can see more stars. I was thinking outside there, you might see there's astronomy versus astrology, and two of the rooms there, there's the Kepler room, and there's the Brahe room there, named after Johannes Kepler and Tycho Brahe, and they were two of the important minds in terms of us understanding the stars and understanding the planets. And the more you read about them, and Brahe's a lot of fun to read about, by the way. Uh, he had an elk that was uh, for his entertainment, but he got drunk and it fell downstairs. Uh, he had a nose that he uh, was made out of gold because he'd lost his original nose in a duel over mathematical equations. You know, his life wasn't just astronomy. But when you <laughs> read about people like that, when you look at the stars, the stars become more the sky becomes wider. Uh, this is interesting, this one actually, the short history of queer women. That just reminds me of uh, a bookshop that I was in in Krakow and uh, they had the queer Bible in their window and uh, an American came in and said he would be suing the shop for there being a, a queer Bible in the window. So that's, that's uh, fun. And this is brilliant. This, this is the book I've most recently had recommended by Warwick Books. So when I return to it, it's just called uh, A Short History of Queer Women. And it's one of the funniest, sharpest and most brilliant books. And it fits into a pocket, so it's a double whammy. Anyway, so <laughs> the, I've got, I, why do I ever make notes? I really thought I'd get through them all. I was gonna do two poems as well, lucky you. <laughs> anyway, so. One of the fun things, by the way, if you have just been watching a little bit of the talk, is uh, I don't really write things very much in advance. I have a lot of stuff that I keep in my head, and uh, also I talk quite quickly. So this being a conference in Prague, it also meant there were um, translators there, there was someone translating my talk into French, and someone translating my talk into German, and I feel very, I, I still apologise to them, uh, I saw them stumble out of their booths because someone came up to me beforehand and they went, oh, do you have a copy of your speech? And I went, oh, I don't really do writing speeches in advance. And I could see a little bit of desperation there. And uh, they went, can you give us some clues? I said, well, I might be talking about some of those books there. And I showed them a pile of books. And, uh, and I said, and I'll try to speak slower. And I did speak slower. In fact, Trent, who of course has made this documentary, said you were definitely speaking at half speed by your standards, but that's still double speed. So uh, yeah, it was quite an adventure and I apologise to uh, all of those who are involved in translating anything that I do in other countries. I will try and at least pretend that I was gonna write a speech. And uh, yeah, so this, is, this was, I think, the, you were the penultimate shop. I think you were the penultimate shop. And, uh, and I found so many things here. I found a great book by Whitney Chadwick all about, uh, I think it was kind of the militant muse about um, women who got called muses but were in fact uh, great artists themselves. But also I'm trying to remember because there was someone who came in who had a book recommendation for them and there was that suspense which I sometimes talk, ah, this one here. And that's a book that I would immediately recommend to everyone. Ruth Ozeki, uh, a book of form and emptiness. That is uh, a brilliant book. Um, so I agree with them there. I've not read any Sally Rooney. People say you should, don't they? And, uh, and then upstairs is, uh, come with me, Trent, and I'll show you what we got here. There is, uh, there's Ginny Smith's Overloaded. Um, there, obviously, a Gruffalo. Um, there, an empty carousel. <laughs> Ah, oh, this is. These are normally the things that are always found whenever I would go to the loo in a shop. If I say, "Oh, can I just go and use the loo?" Most bookshops would always go, "Oh, I'm so sorry about the state of it." And then you'd walk in, and there would be cardboard cutouts of like Jimmy Carr and Mary Berry with a cake and something like this. So you then try and get to the toilet while getting caught in the carousel. Um, this, oh, this is. So these are all the cut price books. This was the one that I found kind of intriguing. Tangled wreckage an encyclopedia of collision. And it's just about different ways that things collide. Uh, buses and coaches, testing emergency, braking, sudden stops, uh, poor pedestrian behavior, poor rider behavior, Trent, poor rider behavior there. So there we go, if you wanna know how a collision happens. Um, it's not a lurid book, it's not one of those kind of things. And then in here is, um, Again, another one here from uh, uh, a regular on our shows. There's Dean Burnett, uh, Emotional Ignorance. Uh, now, what, what are my favourite ones? Obviously, I do like uh, Dean a great deal. Um, art section there, Lives of Lucy and Freud. I've still not read that, Story of Art, and I know I should. I love things like that as well, The Council House. 
We've got a lovely kind of uh, cover and then lots of, lots of brutalism within. So this is uh, Warwick Bookshop, which, which I'm trying to remember how long ago it was that Pauline and Mogg um, took it over. We'll go and find out from them. When did you take over? I'm trying to remember. 2015, yeah. Because you'd worked in theatre, hadn't you? Yeah, basically. Right. And then worked in Paris on the markets. Because yeah. uh, you you found this place, didn't you? And then you, but it was it was it about to close, or I can't remember what was what the story was. My parents was. had come out um, to see us where we were living, and Keith and Francis, who previously had Warwick Books, also owned Kenworth Books, and they'd just sold Kenworth Books. My mum had just given the sort of the little town gossip of you know well they've just sold Kenneth books and they're waiting to sell Warwick books and then Pauline and I looked at each other and we're like I think we're buying a book and are you happy with your decision yeah very happy it isn't what we thought it was so we we absolutely were the classic oh we'll drink tea sell a few books and it will be like you know really cool and dead easy and maybe one of us will have to have another job because it will be you know that little to do and then we Take it home was in the mercy. Bookshop and we found that it's a huge amount of work to do, and that we it was plenty of work for both of us. Um, and now, now we've made it. Now we've gone up a level of difficulty. And you've got someone to take it over take now it as well. Over, when yes, you're old and tired. Yeah. And there was that moment where Lawrence was talking about the lack of LGBT children's books when he was growing up, and the fact that therefore permission to be him wasn't there. This is what books are. Books are so often a permission for people to be who they really are, not the person they disguise themselves as, because very often the parameters of mainstream society are very narrow. And I mean that across so many different areas. I don't just mean about sexuality. I don't just mean about ethnicity. I don't just mean about mental health. There are so many people who don't become what they can truly be because they think they might be the only one. Lawrence, yesterday you were giving a talk about well, your books, which are very dangerous, uh, they're books which sometimes are given a certificate 18. Uh, so I think you know people would be fascinated to know, you know, what kind of books. It's almost like the equivalent of Lady Chatterley's Lover probably was. So can can we just see which which uh, which are these these books that are so dangerous? Um, these are the books. So I don't know whether I would call them dangerous. I've called them joyful. Um, they're books that are celebrating uh, queer joy and queer families, which for many people, unfortunately, is something that's still dangerous. Well, that's the remarkable thing, watching your speech yesterday, which is to get that sense, because before you started the speech, we spoke a little bit about Section 28 from the UK and the book Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin. Does anyone know this book? Anyone? Yeah, anyone? Yeah. You know, so you know, you know a bit of the story of this book, right? I'll tell you about this book. The reason I bring this book again is because I, I've seen that there's a lot of dehumanisation that goes on all the time. And it's very, very important for us to remember that this is not just a thing of the past, that the way the media works, the way that lots of things work, there will, especially when you have a struggling government, a struggling government loves to dehumanise people who've got nothing to do with your struggle because it means that you're not actually noticing the real people who are screwing with you, right? And uh, so this is, um, this was kind of a centrepiece for Section 28, the piece of homophobic legislation uh, from the late 1980s, a piece of legislation which I think politicised me to some extent. And um, this is the book that was the centrepiece. It's a children's book. It's about Jenny, who lives with Eric and Martin. Eric and Martin? No, Eric and Martin. What? Right, so that was it, right? It was basically described as a piece of pornography in the Telegraph, the Times, the Mail, the Express. Um, I bought this, by the way, in Oxfam. I went into the glass cabinet. You know, when you do that thing, go, I shouldn't look in the glass cabinet, but I will. Now they've opened it, I have to buy, right? So I got this. I paid 20 quid for it, right? It's only a kid's book, right? And, and I bought it because, again, it has a social history. So. As a, as, a, as a teenager, I'd read about this book, and I knew that it was probably nonsense. Right? It wasn't in all the schools. They made out it was in all the schools. They made out it was porn pornographic. It's not. I mean, in fact, if you bought it because you heard it was pornographic, <laughs> my, oh, my, would you be annoyed? And that, that's your thing, right? It really, the most pornographic thing in this is at one point, there's a man with a clothes peg in his mouth. I mean, that really is, because he's hanging up. There's, there's nothing, right? And so it was fascinating for me to see this, the reality of it. And then I love this. This is the cartoon at the end, which sums up the book's intentions. Here are Bill and Fred. I love you, Fred. I love you too, Bill. Why don't we move in together? That is a good idea. Uh-oh, here comes grumpy Mrs. Jones. Oh, no. What is this? Two men cannot live together. It is very wrong. But we really love each other. Why is it wrong? It just is. 
Anyway, my husband would never kiss another man, which is quite an odd line in itself, I think. Um, but there we are, so you're pretty certain about that. Um, ready for a twist, Warwick? Because here comes Mr. Jones, and I think he's got a story to tell. <laughs> now, that's not quite right, dear. When I was young, I was in love with a man, and we lived together. But then I met you, and it was you I loved most, and you loved me most. So we moved in together and got married. But goodness, why didn't you ever tell me? And I think we know why. <laughs> She's rash. I always thought it was wrong when two men love each other. There are so many things people think are wrong. It can never be wrong to live with someone you're fond of. I suppose that's right. I never thought of it that way. I'm sorry, you must forgive me. Bye-bye. And and as you said as well, one of the important things for the way you write books is this is not a central position. This is the background. This is just because it's normal. That's true. I mean, there are other books that feature uh, LGBT people for kids, um, but we felt that there was almost all the books are about being different or about overcoming homophobia. That there was a lack of books that just featured fun domestic stories set in same-sex families. So that was something that uh, Elena Braslinia, the, the illustrator, and I wanted to do in creating these books. Um, with Section 28, and especially the book of Jenny Lives with Eric and Martin, it's interesting that that was a translation, and also all of the backlash to my book was also a translation. And I think that very often um, the people who attack um, our books and our lives are using national identity and this is something foreign and, and outside. It doesn't come from our culture. This is something being imposed on us from outside. And I think that's something that often goes hand in hand uh, in the rhetoric attacking us and trying to suppress our lives and our stories. Yeah, I think the Section 28 thing is really interesting. And we have stickers in the shop that is transphobia is just recycled homophobia. It's the same dog whistles. We don't have as much experience of people being like, damn you for having this book in the shop, simply because we, that's who we are. And people, it's a self-selecting audience that's making it through the door. What we get a lot of is pushback on the books that we don't stock. And people saying, well, this is all propaganda if you won't have the other side. And I think that what we've learned through organizations like Hope Not Hate, when they're talking about fascism is, you know, you think that if you shine a light on it and you air hate or you ha air these ridiculous, completely unscientific, completely deluded, misinformed opinions, the people get to see it and then make their own decisions. But actually, that's not how people work. And the most effective way of not giving hate a platform is and, and allowing it to grow is, is by just not doing it. And so for us, we do get... A lot of people go, well, you're a feminist bookshop, but you won't stock, I'm not going to name anyone, but you won't stock X, Y, or Z. And yet you do stock the transgender issue, and you do stock X, Y, Z. And so the pushback we have there means that we are continually in a conversation. We used to be continually in a conversation around censorship, and we were called book burners, and we had stickers all over the shop, and staff was harassed, and it was about what we weren't stocking. Um, but we're a private business and we only have so much room. And so we get to decide what voices we elevate just like any other space. And so for us, it's about, you know, yeah, I, I don't want to participate in making money to someone whose platform and whose career is built on spreading misinformation or hate. So we get to opt out of that as a bookshop. And this idea that anything that means that, oh, what, you haven't stopped Donald Trump's autobiography, that means you're censoring him, is just such a nonsense. I mean, I, th I think there's so many, you know, th th I, I, most of my life I've been a comedian, right? And one of the things that I've always tried to do is not turn myself into what I believe the audience wants. So I might turn up to a gig and someone will say, by the way, there's an enormous number of racists in. And you know what I do? I just die on my ass. Because I, I would be like, well, I'm not going to turn my material into something that I don't believe in. I mean, I think it's really important that we understand and recognize that children live in the world with us. And so anything that exists in the world is an appropriate topic for a children's book. It needs to be done in an age-appropriate way. Um, you know what I mean? I would write uh, same-sex relationships differently for a young adult book than for a board book like these. Um, but that doesn't mean, I mean... 
children live in the world with us. Uh, there was recently an, an op-ed that appeared in Haaretz in, in Israel where a woman, uh, her neighbor had complained, why, are, why is she reading my books when she doesn't have a family with two mothers? And she's like, I have this other book about a talking cow and no one ever complains that my daughter's never going to meet a t talking cow in Tel Aviv. You know, it's much more likely that she'll meet families with two mothers or two fathers. And so for her, it was completely uh, understandable. I mean, the same thing that I grew up I had no, you know, I'm born in 1971, I had no role models when I was growing up, and so I would have had a much easier uh, time accepting myself if I had had access to books like these. You know, I mean, I think that reading my books will not turn any child LGBT, but it'll hopefully make children not be as homophobic, um, and it may for people, they may see themselves re represented in the books, or they may see the people around them represented. You know, it's it sort of... Um, the backlash like in Hungary or in Russia where the book's forbidden for, for children under 18 and it's, it's creating a generation that is unequipped to live in the global society that we live in. Suddenly they're 18 and it's, oh, we've been lying to you for the first 18 years of your lives. You know, there are homosexuals in the world and it's like, you know, they're not preparing their own citizens to live in the global, the global culture that we live in. So this guy was, was, was waiting and then he came up to me and he talked about a book I've been recommending. It's a book called Welcome to St. Hell by Lewis Hancocks. Lewis Hancocks is uh, a trans man who was brought up in St. Helens and, uh, and it's about his life, of what it was like to be in a pretty small place and to very much feel on the outside. And this man just said to me, he said, oh, I wanted to just talk to you. He said, you recommended Welcome to St. Hell. So I bought it, and he had this very, like, I couldn't judge where his face was going. He said, and, uh, and so I, I bought it for my son. And I read it beforehand. And then I gave it to my son. And he immediately said, oh, I know Lewis Hancock's. I've seen some of his stuff on YouTube. And I realized he knew all about him already. And that's when I realized I hadn't bought this book so my son could understand himself more. I had bought this book, really, so I could understand my son more. And I thought that was such a beautiful thing. Just on Tuesday, this moment where he wanted to share the fact that he had found a book that had, you know, and, and of course, as you probably know, in the UK at the moment, there are appalling culture wars because that's what happens when you have uh, an inept, greedy, uh, duplicitous and clumsy government is they turn again. Oh, by the way, it's not a political speech. Uh, it is all... <laughs> this is, uh, just so you know, an objective truth. Uh, <laughs> I mean, because St Helens at times, you know, in your book is quite, uh, you know, it can be quite bleak, mm. especially if you're yeah. someone who doesn't feel that you fit in with the status quo. Yeah. But having somewhere like the book stop, which is such a kind of rich, independent bookshop, isn't it? And cooperative. Yeah, they were amazing. And something I was very keen to say was that I'm not dissing St. Helens. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's calling it St. Hell, even in the title, it's, it is a metaphor for my own teenage hell, you know? And I think so many people can relate to that, can't they? They're growing up in a small town, you know, um, and feeling like an outsider. It was my hell. Um, but... I've, I, my heart is very still connected yeah. to St. Helens. I live down in Portsmouth now, but my mum still lives in St. Helens. I've got old friends there. So it, I, I did a book signing in the bookstop, the, the shop that you went to, and it just felt like home. And to see all of the teenagers coming for a copy of my book that perhaps some of them, and, and some of them were um, transgender like myself and had struggled with things that, you know, they said my book has given them hope and it just felt it meant a lot to me, you know. Mm. So I, I still feel that real connection with the town, you know. You know, when people come into your shops, the first thing is they don't have to have the same mundane conversation that they'll very often have in other shops where they do the traditional, this is, hello, how are you? How was your Christmas? Is Jean well? You know, one of those kind of conversations. They, I was watching this documentary the other day. It was about this goat that only had one eye. And I was wondering if you had a book that was kind of about, well, monocular goats or similar species, right? <laughs> they can start off with that kind of conversation, right? And I also know that, you know, that, that idea of the safe space, and that is, again, of course, something that's very often belittled by people in the media, but the people in the media who talk about that are very often millionaires who haven't realised that they do live in a safe space because they have the world, is pretty, they are able to control a lot of it. For a lot of other people, they don't have that space. For a lot of other people, they might be in a tiny little flat with noise all around them. They might have so much chaos around them. They might not have that Virginia Woolf idea of a room of one's own. They might have nowhere to escape to. 
but they come to the bookshop and immediately there's that beauty of the fact that they are surrounded by so many thoughts and voices. All of that potential on every single spine. And they also know, that, I mean, I can genuinely say, there was not a single bookshop that I've visited in the last two years that I did not find the people who ran it to be delightful. And people would very often, they, they ask me after talks, they'll say, no, but honestly, what was your favorite bookshop? And the truth is, my favorite bookshop was whichever one I was in at the time. Hopefully I have reached people mm. that, you know, that it wouldn't normally reach. Um, but that's my aim with everything. I mean, you know, uh, you, you might have seen, you know, looking at my social media, I do a lot of um, comedy, like comedy sketches online. And um, I did that for a quite a good few years without talking about being trans. Mm -hmm. So I built this following on my social media and they didn't know I was trans. I started doing by doing impressions of my mum um, and they kind of went a bit viral and she became known as British mum. Um, and my mum loves it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, so it's like I, I kind of, what I quite liked was that people followed me for the comedy first mm. and then I revealed that I was trans and now I put it into my comedy a lot and, you know, telling uh, my story in this book in a way that I hadn't ever done before. And I think, well, I like to think it kind of eased people into the idea of what a trans person is, you know, because before they knew it, they were happened to be following somebody that happened to be trans mm. and that wasn't what people were associating me with, you know. So then with the book, I felt like I could go deeper um, into that trans story. Or, it, it, coming from a point where I felt like I'd already kind of established myself and my humour and just the, my passions and the things that I love. You know, because being trans is such a small part of who I am, you know, uh, which I hope the book gets across. Yeah, yeah. Too. You know, the success of a show like uh, the, the books on the show of Heartstopper, you know, really shows how, um, you know, from the Section 28 days until today, Many things have changed. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are trying to go back to the prehistoric times, uh, culturally, politically, etc. Especially in the UK right now, but um, yeah, and also in the US. I mean, my father likes to joke that my books are banned in Russia, Hungary, and Florida, for instance. Um, you know, he says it in the sort of self-deprecating, uh, humorous tone. But I mean, it is true. Yeah, I mean, there are many places in the US where where the books, unfortunately, are not allowed to be read. Um, there's a lot of you know people wanting to control and to keep a uneducated populace is much easier to control. And so you know by preventing them from learning about many things that happened in the U.S. Um, and things the U.S. has done in other places, how the U.S. has dealt with uh, racial issues, for instance, sexuality. Um, if they can create a generation that doesn't know anything about that, they'll be much easier to control. And so I think that's a lot of the attempts to to suppress books comes comes from that impulse. I think we have to open ourselves to open the gay community, the LGTB community, they have to open themselves. I mean, we gain all these laws and we, we are now in Spain, we had a beautiful years in Spain for the gay or LGTB community because we teach the people, we teach the society who we were, you know? I mean, they didn't know us. Their fear was uh, because they didn't know us. I mean, everybody was in the closet. No one was saying, I am a gay, I am a lesbian, you know? And uh, we did teach them, and we explained them who we were, you know? And that changed the whole thing. I don't think so in Spain we are going to have that, that what, the, what we are having in, in the States, okay? Even though we have a, a very extreme right uh, party, right wing party, you know? We're not going to have that because the society has learned that everybody can have a beautiful life in the whole society, you know? I mean, and I think the best thing is visibility, visibility, visibility in everything, you know? I mean, uh, we become from a dictatorship, you know? And it's very close. I, th and I think that makes the difference between the States and England, you know? We know what is to live in a dictatorship. When I born, Franco was alive, you know, and we don't forget, and we, and we don't forget that, and that's the best thing. I don't know in many years with the young people they don't know even who is Franco, you know, but at the moment this thing won't happen in Spain because we know what life was before, you know, the life that we have before. But in the future, I don't know. In Spain at the moment we don't have that. We have some voices for the right wing party from Vox. But uh, they don't 
they don't, the society doesn't care much about that, okay? I mean, think we have the best laws in Europe for the gay community now. For the LGTB, we just passed the trans law. We, we, have, uh, we, we have marriage law since 2005, you know. We can adopt with any problem, you know. I mean, uh, we have all the laws, the laws that we needed. And I don't think so, these laws that are going to be taken off from us, you know, I don't think so. Certainly the publishing industry has a long history of suppressing the diversity of voices that live in the world with us. You know, I mean, I think that um, very often I try in, in the, the books that I do, especially the children's books, to see who's not being uh, represented and find ways of making those voices more visible. Um, I think that it's children normalize the absences that they see in children's books. So if, if certain people are never, even if they see them in the world, if, if those stories are never being part of the culture, children normalize that these are less important. Um, it's something that uh, as an author and as a children's bookseller in the past, um, you see how boys will read books uh, or girls will read books with either boy characters or girl characters, but at a certain point, boys stop reading books with girl characters because they realize that women have less social agency and power. And so if they're seen reading in public a book with a female main character, they're on a lower social rank. Um, we see this a lot with the adult books with LGBT characters where um, a book with a male, with a gay male character and a male byline is a gay book and the gayness contaminates the reader. All, almost all of the books with LGBT, with, especially with gay male characters that have had mainstream success are written by women. So you have like Anne Rice's Gay Vampires or Brokeback Mountain, you know, and it's sort of like um, a straight man who's seen reading one of those books in public. Yes, it has this gay content, but it's a woman. So it's, it's, it's sort of less, you know, but if it had been written by me, for instance, or by a gay male, openly gay male writer, the gayness, people automatically assume that that reader is also gay. Um, so that, that conditions a lot socially how we read, what we read. Um, it's sort of one of the interesting things about ebooks is that we can read without in public people seeing what we're reading. And so um, that gives a lot more freedom for people. Um, it's, you don't have to go to a bookshop and be seen buying a book in public that you may be, for whatever reason, embarrassed about. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's been an interesting development. Yeah, so, I mean, for us, we, we've moved the LGBT section many times over the years, and it's in a different place than when the bookshop was worth power. Where we found it's most comfortable is where it is loud and proud and very visible and easy to find, but also not in a space that's immediately visible when you walk in the front door or walk, when you walk into the nonfiction room which gives people a chance to be slightly cocooned when they are maybe looking at books that might be more vulnerable or expose them to people they might not be out to and, and simply to stand in front of a rainbow flag is not the most comfortable experience for a lot of people and our LGBT section, a lot of the books are coded with the rainbow flag. It's not a subtle section, it's not subtle publishing. So I think having it somewhere that is really easy to find, and again, we all do that as booksellers with a lot of different sections. It's like you wouldn't put a disability section on the top shelf of a bookcase because then anyone in a wheelchair isn't gonna reach it. Like having a sensitivity to who is my buyer, who is my reader, and being like, okay, where's the most comfortable place for those books to exist, you know, while giving it, you know, it's why we put our anti-racism and post-colonial stuff in the front room. It's like we want people to walk into a room that is full of people of color and writers of color and for that to be one of the first things that you see. It also isn't a section that has a degree of vulnerability around standing in front of it. So I think that's the balancing act. And another good thing is that the LGTB community, they lost the fear to be on the streets and show themselves. And that's the most important thing, you know? They are no fear anymore. We, from, from the business, or from my business, and from the uh, activism, we, we create that, don't be afraid. Our, our fear is their strength. And if we, we are not afraid, they won't be strong. And that's, that's the, the best thing we did, teach the own LGTB people. Because of course in 1993 they were all in the closet because they were afraid. And they become out, 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 out and more. Our pride is one million people. But, but not only one million people of, of LGTB people. A lot of heterosexual people go to the pride to see because they enjoy it. 
that is a, a good thing we have done. I think the best thing is to show us, to show us on the streets, on a normal life, you know, on our jobs and everything. And uh, I think at the moment in Spain, we are doing all right, but I don't know in the future. What, what we do need, as, as the, the diversity panel mentioned, was we need to make sure there are more stories from a wider group of people, uh, which is why people like me, uh, a, a, a white man, can barely get any books published at all. <laughs> he said because he was a liar. Um, a load of crap. Anyway, so um, this is, sorry, I suddenly got very, very brusque there, but I, uh, I find it very interesting when people start to lose their advantages and just get the same, you know, as we start to iron some of those things out, people think they're actually losing their rights. And it's kind of, you know, there, there was a guy in, uh, in one of the, the British newspapers recently who had been in publishing and he said, sometimes I worry that due to diversity diversity, we won't find the next John Grisham. And so people had different reactions to that. Some people were over the moon. And, uh, <laughs> but what is interesting to me is that is looking at it from entirely the wrong way round. Because what that's really saying is, have we missed the next John Grisham because the next John Grisham was LGBT, or the next John Grisham was a person of color, or the next John Grisham was working class, and all of that. So it's not saying someone's lost the chance. What it's saying is we haven't been looking widely enough. That's why I wrote the book. You know, I wrote it to help other people that are in my situation, but also I wrote it for anyone and everyone, and something that my message is always that just because I've been through this particular journey of being trans, we've all, we all go through our own journeys. We've all, it's like you say, it's hard to be a human and to be mm. conscious, isn't it? And that's what I, I wanted anyone to be able to pick up the book and relate to it and, you know, learn about what it is to be trans, but also just see, you know, me as the, as the character, um, me as a human, and that, um, realise that we actually all struggle with very similar things in life, you know? Um, so I wanted people to pick up this book and that wouldn't normally read about this sort of thing. You yeah. know, I wanted it to be kind of, I suppose I wrote it a bit like, it's what I wish I'd had as a teenager. You know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to read anything too political or serious or um, educational. Um, and I wouldn't have wanted to read anything, I think, back then that was too trans-specific. You know, I just wanted to create a story that was... Um, relatable to everybody about being a misfit teenager, growing up, finding yourself, and, and with humour, uh, you know, it's very important to me to tell things with humour mm. um, and empathy for everybody else as well. Like, I go into my parents' uh, point of view, my friends' point of view. I think that's really important as well. It was the outsider that I empathised with, regardless of that being coded as somebody who was queer. Um, and it's actually only as an adult and actually only in the last five years of running the shop and being in an explicitly queer space that I have been unlearning a lot of internalized homophobia that even in an accepting home, I realized that I had imbibed. And now I'm finally reading a lot of queer stuff where I'm like, ah, oh, queer romance novels. Like here is, that's what a relation, a joyful relationship looks like. It doesn't all have to be misery and death. And, you know, so I, it is now only really as an adult that I'm looking at those. And like Lawrence's book is such a joy. It's such a simple, you know, so I think there are children's books now that I'm really enjoying being able to put in people's hands that have moved on from Tango Makes Three. We're allowed to make the queer couples humans rather than animals now. Um, and I feel a great deal of joy when I look at what young people get to grow up with now, from like the Alex Gino books to like, it's like they're out there. But for me, I, I, I didn't get there until I was an adult. And this is the book I wanted to show you. This was, as I said, from Mari at the Lighthouse Bookshop. She gave me this when I was on the Bibliomaniac tour. And I love this book. It's called Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Sea Mammals, right? And you might say, what's that about? And I'll tell you. It's some black feminist lessons from sea mammals. It really does do what it says. And it is such a kind and generous book, which again, to me, the purpose of so many stories is to punch holes in our reality tunnel and to allow new light in. And this is what Alexis Pauline Gums, who, who wrote this book, uh, she became fascinated by sea mammals. And she put up an Instagram page with pictures of sea mammals. And she started to notice that the sea mammals, in, in all their beauty, the way that they'd actually been categorised, the way they'd been observed, said a great deal about who was most dominant 
in that culture. And that actually sometimes we're not seeing, it again, very rarely, I, I don't actually believe we can ever truly see anything objectively. But, you know, we can lessen the subjectivity as things like the Large Hadron Collider, etc. We can lessen the subjectivity, but we must always be aware that there will be some subjectivity in our interpretation of reality. And so she noticed that, and she wrote this book, looking at the sea mammals and looking at the way society has been. And there's just this beautiful, this, the, you know, when you just see one line in a book again and you think, this book is for me. She asked the question, who is this book for? This book is for you also known as everyone who knows that a world where queer black feminine folks are living their most abundant, expressed and loving lives is a world where everyone is free. You know, I was talking yesterday about when, you know, someone having a very positive reaction to Welcome to St. Hell, and that makes me happy yeah, that, that yeah, those kind yeah. of... So, so yeah. what are the books where you just go, that, I'm so glad that's leaving the shop in that person's yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah, You mean other than your books, Robin? Well, yeah, 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 other... <laughs> other other than my patriarchal books about the nature of bookshops. You know, your love letter to bookshops. Why would I want anyone to buy that? I had such a great time making this and I absolutely love going to bookshops and libraries and, uh, and I love making documentaries. We don't just make documentaries at Cosmic Shambles about books, we make them about science and ideas and films and if you can support us please go to patreon.com slash Cosmic Shambles and if you can't support us financially then subscribe to our channel, follow us on social media, bye bye.